Good afternoon, scholars, students, colleagues, and audience. Good evening, everyone who is not in Brazil, because we are in the afternoon and you are in the evening. So good evening, uh, those who are attending this event in Ireland, in France, Argentina, anywhere else. And thank you all for coming and join us again today. The main idea of this series of chats is to disseminate a body of knowledge about Ireland and produce, produced by historians, novelists, poets, filmmakers, playwrights, and any other person connected to the world of Irish studies. Today, <clears throat> we are going to discuss Irish history. But what is history? The most concise and fundamental definition of history is a branch of knowledge dealing with past events, a written record of what happens in the past, what happens in the present, and what will happen in the future is very much governed by what happened in the past. What would it be like to live in a society without history, with absolutely no knowledge of the past, without a truly analysis of the evidence of the past, we would be without identity. Then, the only way we can have a knowledge of the past, its language, beliefs, customs, identity, and traditions, in short, its cultural artifacts, is through history. History provides us a sense of the past. The past refers to an earlier time. It considers its people and societies who inhabited it and events that happened there. What happened in the past cannot be changed, but history changes over time and is subjected to regular revision and interpretation. This is why historians may deal with history in different ways. They may focus on different aspects. They may prioritize on prominent individuals, great leaders, their personality, strength, actions, ambition, abilities, or on social and political movements, factors, forces, and ideas that happen or influence significant historical changes. They may also do both. This previous talk on history and historians is to introduce our guest speaker today, Professor Dermo Kyo, whose works show how diverse is his research. Together with Professor Kyo, we also have my postdoctoral mentor and friend <laughs> at USP, Professor Dr. Laura Izaha. He's still introducing the Irish historian today I should say that the themes he develops in his research is related to European, North American, and Latin American diplomatic and political history in the 19th and 20th centuries, contemporary international relations, human rights and foreign policy formulation, administrative history, and the decision-making process, the study of post-war, World War II European integration, trade union and labor history, religion and popular politics, church-state relations, the history of the Vatican, Irish specialist interests, politics and society from the 18th to the 20th century, issues of church and state, popular religion, 
devotional practices and the churches, diocesan and parish history, episcopal decision making, emigration and the Irish abroad, the, the rise of the Irish trade unionism and the history of the Irish labor movement, the development of Irish diplomacy in foreign policy, the senior civil service and the evolution of Irish administrative culture, the state and culture, the visual arts, theater, cinema in Ireland. So as you can see, he covers a huge number of things. So besides being a historian, Professor Koch was on the staff of the University College Cork for 30 years. He taught the Department of History between 1980 and 2010. He was Dean Munnett Professor in the Department of History at UCC between 1990 and 1996, and Professor of History from 1997. He served as a head of department between 2002 and 2009. A long list of works could be included here, but I cite just a few, only a few. Island in Europe, 1919-1948. Island the Vatican, the politics and diplomacy of church and state. Uh, 1922, uh, Jews in 20th century Ireland, refugees, anti-Semitism and Holocaust, Jack Lynch, a biography. Uh, so to mark Professor's long association with UCC, a prize fund has been instituted for the annual award of Dermot Kill Prize in Irish history. We have to say we are very honored and pleased to have you here, Professor Kyo, and the great chance of reading the first chapter of your next book about the Irish in Argentina before being published. Thank you very much for your reliability and kindness in gently forwarding it to Laura and me. The chapter of this book starts with the presence of the first Irish diplomat, Timothy Joseph Horan, on Argentine soil, and the historical report he writes about the country based on his personal observations. Here, we can see two narrators, Timothy Joseph Horan and Dermot Kill. The former, writes the present and the past based on his perception of the Irish in Argentina and this experience he collects, making judgments and interpretation. The story starts when he moved to Argentina as a diplomat in 1958, highlighting how limited his information was owing to the impossibility of covering alone, citing Professor Kill, any great detail, the political, social, cultural, economic, and geographic complexities of Argentina. And the latter, Dermot Kill, retells Horan's story in the present. He writes the past in the present based on Horan's report, analyzing the gaps he left in his text adding new facts he missed. It means that the contemporary narrator updates Horan's text, enhances it, giving a new light to the facts he was not able to cover. Why Horan's text is just a 21-page report on the history of the Irish in Argentina, Dermot is a book whose first chapter contains about 50 pages. As you can see, both are historians in his own ways, with particular purposes. While the former was eager 
to report to his superior in Dublin his experiences abroad, the latter seems to be ready to review the past, assessing and filtering Horan's text, enriching it with new information on the arrival of European migrants in Argentina, the advent of the railways, works of renowned painters and poets without leaving aside notable names of its history. After this brief introduction of the historian and his works, we want to thank again Professor Demot for accepting our invitation for the interview. Welcome, Professor Demond, to a virtual Brazil. Consider you could be you could not be here in March when the pandemic outbroke and spread across the globe. Now I leave the floor to Professor Laura Izaha, a full professor of literatures in English at the University of Sao Paulo, Associate Director at USP International Education Art, Coordinator of WB Yates Chair of Irish Studies, former Professor President of the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies, uh, between 2009 to 2018. Author of many books as well. <laughs> Murals of Holographic Labyrinth, The Process of a New Aesthetic Synthesis in the Novel of John Benville, Narrativas de la Diaspora Irlandesa, Barro La Cruz del Sul, Buenos Aires, 2010, Editor of uh, Da Irlanda para o Brasil, Textos Críticos, since 2009. Roger Casement in Brazil, 2010. The Portuguese translation of the Amazon Journal of Roger Casement, 2016. So, among many others. So, Dr. Laura Zaha has published widely on Irish contemporary literature. At present, her main research interests are literature of the diaspora, cultural trauma, and memory studies. The floor is yours, Professor Laura. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Noelia. Thanks a lot for, the, for your invitation. And I want to congratulate you and your team for the organization of all this series of lives, uh, bringing Irish culture to Brazil and even um, uh, beyond its frontiers. It is also a great honor uh, to, to be here and to have the opportunity to talk with Professor Dermot Keogh, that as you uh, have already introduced him, we know that he is a very well-known historian and he has always been our guidance in our Irish studies in order to get all the, the background that we need to understand better literature, culture, cinema, drama, and everything what we want to study uh, about Ireland. So, so thank you very much, because this uh, series also gives us the opportunity um, to, to be connected uh, to be comforted in this time of the pandemics and also in mainly to keep the links alive, even with our partner professors and, and universities that we are uh, working together. So I would like to, uh, to start before we start uh, asking questions to Professor Dermot Keogh. Um, I would like uh, to... Um, uh, you, uh, Dermot, to tell the audience how you have become interested in the history, Irish Argentine history, after writing extensively about Ireland and Europe, Ireland and the Vatican, as all the, the books that Professor uh, Noelia has mentioned, and mainly also your um, uh, history of contemporary Ireland, 20th century. Uh, Ireland, no? So uh, why you became interested in telling that story 
of the um, Irish diaspora to Argentina, mainly to Argentina. Well, uh, thank you, Laura, and thank you very much, Noelia, for this invitation. Um, <clears throat> the question is a broad one, and I welcome it because I find it difficult to answer myself. But let me say that um, I started, I, my, my interest in Latin America began in the early 1960s, and uh, I spent a few years in a seminary, and I was destined uh, to probably be posted to Latin America. And there I met um, a human rights worker, latterly Patrick Rice. But I maintained a strong interest through my university career as an undergraduate in uh, Latin America and, of course, in Spain and Portugal. And in order to fund my postgraduate work in 1970, I worked as a journalist and uh, again had an opportunity to uh, study um, Latin American politics, the coup in, uh, in uh, Chile in 1973, then to visit uh, and report on the coup in Portugal in 74 and go back for Spinola's counter coup in 75. And um, uh, so, so, the, so, so the association is a slow, slow burn, but I continued on through my doctoral work, which I did in, it in Italy at the Euro University, University Institute, European University Institute. And then finally sort of in university when I went to, uh, no, before that I was um, a journalist working on the television and radio. And then I had an occasion to go to El Salvador in 19, 1980. And, uh, um, and then I got my job in university. So then I was able to teach Latin American history and I had a great interest in uh, Argentina, and uh, I had my first opportunity to go there in nineteen in two in two thousand. Um, I had many friends in Argentina, many friends in the human rights movement throughout Latin America, and my wife used to say that if the left came to power in Latin America, we wouldn't have to uh, stay in a hotel for our entire visits to uh, the to that's wonderful part of the world for the rest of our lives. Uh, that, but that was just a joke, that we, an, in, an in-house joke. So Argentina then became a, a great interest due to my close friendship with human rights workers there in the in 2000s. And um, my frequent visits there um, during my last 10 years in university and then further 10 years of retirement probably 16, 17 visits to Argentina in those 20 years, um, doing research and, uh, and, and pursuing my interest in the Irish in Argentina, but also in a broader sense, Argentine history and the history of other um, groups, emigrant groups uh, who, who came with the Irish in the latter part or throughout the 19th century, the Basques and, the, and, and others. So uh, that, Laura, is not in a nutshell, but that's generally sort of my tour of uh, uh, and my long-term interest over 50 years now in Latin America. So I'm very much at home in the archives in Buenos Aires and working on this topic on the Irish in Argentina. The first book I did was the 2016 book that you mentioned, and that was really looking at sort of emigration uh, in the 19th century. And the next book that I hope to write will bring the story up to the 21st century, or at least to the end of the uh, 20th century. Um, and um, I find it a, a topic of great interest. So um, church history and or the history of the Catholic church and that sometimes has its limitations if you spent 25 years doing it and other uh, history, areas of history, um, the excitement of working in the archives in and living in Buenos Aires and taking the bus in Buenos Aires and doing all those wonderful things that are uh, so so stimulating. Um, there's no reason why uh, I wouldn't want to be going back to Argentina for another 20 years and of course hopefully to Brazil sometime. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Now it's my turn for another question. <laughs> 
In the beginning of your first chapter, we come to know there were two different inhabitants as well as two opposite forces operating in the territory of Argentina. On the one hand, citing uh, the tribes of Indians, primitives, warlike, and completely savage. And on the other, the settlers to the new state. On one side, the Christians, immigrant Euro Europeans, helping the local government in the process of civilization. And on the other, raids of roving savages, completely recalcitrant of all civilizing influences, I quote from the, your text, resisting the presence of the foreigners in their territory. How do you analyze Foran's description of the Indians as primitives, warlike, and completely savage in the light of the theories of contemporary times? Well, <clears throat> I think Horan was very much a man of his time. Uh, in many ways, his report was very advanced in terms of his self-criticism or his criticism of uh, Irish uh, emigrants and their attitude towards the, their employees, etc. But I think uh, he, I suppose, may be forgiven for not doing any primary work on um on on the history of argentina in the in this particular respect so what he took from what he puts in his report is very much the received view of um the uh, the struggle in argentina in the uh, in the 19th century um he uh, he, he he is uh, i suppose um, a reader of uh, santiago usher his biography of um uh, Father Fahi and the Irish sources that he would have consulted would have had that stereotypical view of the conflict <clears throat> that followed the expulsion of the Spaniards and the British from Argentine territory, the sort of reconquest of the interior and the um, so called, in inverted commas, civilization uh, of, um, of Argentina. Uh, through the bringing of or the encouragement of may, may large numbers of European immigrants to come to to come to uh, that country, so Horan is part of is very much part of uh, of the mindset of that of of that early generation. Um, he's critical, but I think in terms of his report and in terms of his understanding of Argentine history, that was. Um, secondary to the main points that he wanted to make. And it is a rather discursive view of uh, very complex events in Argentina in the 19th century, uh, but it is in no way original. Um, it is very, as I say, much a reflection of his reading. It's simply a regurgitation of what he was reading in Irish Argentine sources, let me stress. Um, uh, so depicting, and I use the, the sociological phrase, the etiological myth, and this is something that isn't just particular to Argentina, uh, but it's, you know, the Irish coming to Argentina would have been the, the victim of this idea of society being an evolution from barbarism through to civilization. And in the case of the Irish who were coming to Argentina, they were leaving a country that had been subject to a fairly savage colonial uh, col succession of colonial regimes. And um, many or the bulk of the Irish going to Argentina in the 19th century uh, arrived around the time of the famine in the 1840s, after 1847, and into the 1850s and 1860s. So this was a, a generation of, uh, uh, of Irish who came having been dispossessed in many in in many cases mm -hmm. uh, having fleeing from hunger starvation and death and um also having seen their lands you know taken from them at, through the plantations in earlier generations 
and also suffering from uh, the threat to their language, which was the Irish language. So coming to Argentina, they were coming to a country and entering into the history of Argentina at a time when there were vast tracts of land to be settled. So um, I have not investigated, nor have I found in the sense in what I've read, any evidence that the Irish really interrogated what was happening in Argentina and why there was so much land available. Um, these were people who came uh, refu where were seeking refuge in a country where their rights would be protected, unlike the country from which they were coming. And um, they found in Argentina a haven uh, where they could settle on the land and they didn't suffer as they used to in Ireland from land hunger. They could actually sort of find vast tracts of land which would allow them to um, uh, to to carry on as um, as productive farmers um, into the latter part of the 19th century. And one doesn't want to write uh, a romantic history of Argentina, and that's why my first chapter would be uh, would would agree with the criticisms of Horan that the treatment of the worker workers brought out to Ireland, the farm labourers, etc., was very similar to the way in which farm labourers were treated in Ireland, that is, with very little sort of dignity or respect. So um, it, it, one doesn't want to in any way, and nor do I, tr do I romanticise the um, I Irish em uh, immigration to Argentina, other than to say that there were those uh, who were very successful, there were those who were very, uh, who who, who um, uh, owned large tracts of land. There were those who became very wealthy, but there are great silences in the history that another generation will take on writing. The silences, for example, around the um, way in which the estancieros treated their workers. There are silences around the way in which, uh, what was the role of women in 19th century, Irish women in 19th century Argentina. There's virtually, there's little or nothing um, on that particular subject um, in any coherent way. The instructrices, as they were called, or governesses who used to go to Argentina in the 19th century to take res up residence in an estancia, um, there's virtually nothing written about uh, that category of uh, women uh, who emigrated from Ireland um, to play that educational role. So I'm very conscious of the silences uh, in Irish Argentine history, and I'm very conscious of the need to do really sort of detailed research in that area. My work, um, was, I think, just covers in a very superficial way uh, the uh, 19th century, uh, but my, my, the Burden of my work is mainly on 20th century. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I'm sorry for being so long-winded. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you very much. So my next year, I have a question now. Yes, please. I'm quite willing to answer every question. <laughs> In the 19th century, the idea of European cultural and moral superiority reached its peak with a presumed historical mission of civilization, the rest of the world, by expanding European influence and by colonization. How do you analyze the evolution of the civilized barbarian dichotomy from its origin in the 19th century to its recent incarnation in the international relations theory? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm not keeping pace with the international relations theory, but um, I think I can try and answer in a, in a, in a, your question in, a, in, a, in, a, in another way. Um, dealing with the Irish um, and the, the way in which this um, was worked out, um, I'd like to think that uh, the whole issue of relations between the settlers and the Indians um, or the Amerindians or whatever names one wish to use, the different tribes 
would, would be a complex story uh, and one not simply of um, of, uh, of of civilization versus barbarism because in many of the frontiers in in Argentina are those lands that have butted uh, the territories uh, that were were to to which the where where the Indians were driven to um, there had to be interface there had to be inter exchange and it, it would be well worth exploring whether or not the um, the settlers um, developed a good a good working relationship in some instances with those who had their land taken from them now um in 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 answering your your question um in the contemporary context i i, I prefer to root myself in the historical context and simply pose the question um uh, in answer to your question that the work in these areas really hasn't been done. So I'm very conscious when I, when I sit down and I do my research, I'm very conscious of what my limitations are as I focus on diplomatic history, uh, but there are a million other paths that I would like to, tr to thread. And one of them that I would suggest uh, to the younger um, historians who may be listening is there's no history, for example, of an Irish estancia, and um, just the same as the medievalist uh, Le Roy Le, Le Dury wrote on Montelieu or so. This idea of taking an estancia and writing its history, um, and writing of the complex so inter so, uh, the social relations within that sovereign state, if you like, um, in in Argentina or those sovereign states within Argentina having their own money in some instances. I collected some of those coins when I was in Argentina, um, mm -hmm. and and working out how they functioned uh, would be a very um, significant piece of work, uh, and there must be estancias in Ar Argentina with very comprehensive archives that could produce, uh, where you could produce a um, a history of a particular a particular estancia like the Cabanas or any of the big names. Uh, Casey or you, you, you know, um, you name them and they're there. But I would hope that another generation of historians would would take on that task. Thank you, Laura. Yes, yes very, very interesting this part. And I, I would like to um, to mention your previous book, uh, Derm the Independence of Ireland and uh, the Argentine uh, Connection. Uh, which was published in 2016, and uh, uh, you built the first diplomatic bridge between Ireland and Argentina, unveiling the history of Eamon Bulfin, yes. uh, one of the rebels uh, of the 1916 rising, Easter Rising, who was not executed as his mother claims that uh, he, he was an Argentine citizen. So in your forthcoming book, uh, you you go deeper into his story, and I would like you to comment on it. As um, while he was, because when he was in prison, um, waiting for to be tried, uh, he became friends with um, um, Michael Collins, as you mentioned, and Michael Collins is so important, uh, one of the leaders of the War of Independence, and then we have all this uh, story, long story, uh, to, to link him. But the reason I am asking you this is because I see some parallels um, of his diplomatic actions in Argentina with um, his, uh, the role of his father, William Bulfin, when he lived in Argentina and mainly in the last years before his death, commuting from Buenos Aires, Dublin and, and the United States. And also, I think um, I see a parallel with Roger Trasement um, uh, because he, when he became a rebel, he had more or less the this, this same kind of actions of gun running, of um, raising money, of uh, training the Irish Brigade in Germany. So, and, and, and Roger Casement is very much vivid nowadays in Brazil because even last week 
there was a film on Roger Casement and all mm -hmm. his life, especially based on the Amazon Journal. So could you tell the audience which was really Eamon Bulfin's mission in Argentina? Was he, was he well received because he left Argentina when he was 10 years old and then he went straight to, to school, to Edna School, a famous uh, school. And um, also, is he considered an Irish hero because of the rebellion? Um, well, y y yes, as you said, uh, um, Eamon Bulfin was born in 1892. Uh, to William Bulfin, the great, you know, figure or very well known in 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 Argentina and in 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 Irish uh, circles, and um, <clears throat> he brought his family back to Ireland in, as you said, in, in 1902. And while he went back to Argentina, he um, left his his uh, four children, uh, three three sisters, and uh, and and the, his only son to be educated in Ireland. Now, William Bulfin set a very, I suppose, strong headline for his son, um, whom he wouldn't have seen that often between 1902 and 1909, although he did come back more frequently than we could even imagine, um, uh, given the transportation and the length of time on the sea he would have to, he had to spend. But he, 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 he put his son into um, an educational institution that is the um, Porrick Pierce's uh, St. Enda's. And of course, uh, he was schooled in the revolutionary tradition, becoming a member of the IRB. At a very young age, he studied engineering in, 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 in UCD, but lived in the Pierce and in St. Enda's uh, while he was at university. So when it came to 1916, he was one of the inner circle. He was a very young man, but was he his father's son? Because his father had died in, in 1910, in January 1910, very suddenly. But we don't know what the father would have done in the intervening period, other than to say that he, I think he would have been radicalized. And I bring the parallel with the O'Reilly, who went out in 1916, even if he didn't agree with the violence uh, and was uh, killed uh, in, the, in the fighting. So I think, um, Bulfin, William Bulfin would have been conflicted. His son, however, was a revolutionary. He was a soldier. He wasn't a thinker in the way that his father was as a journalist. So coming to Argentina for him was a real penance because in the intervening period between 1916, he had avoided the death sentence. He'd been sent to jail in England where he became very friendly, of course, with, um, with, with Michael Collins and then jailed again in 1918 for the German plot of that period. And um, he, he was, it was a penance for him to be sent to Argentina because he wanted to lead um, a soldier's life in the revolution between 1919 and 21. So uh, coming to Argentina for him was a real sacrifice and a penance. Um, and he, he became, he was a diplomat without any training. And of course, as, as I relate in my book, um, having arrived in Argentina as a dangerous revolutionary being deported by the British, the first thing the Argentine authorities did was to call him up to military service and put him in the Navy until the, he managed to get out because he was the only son of a widow. And, uh, uh, and then to spend his time sort of as a diplomat with no resources uh, working in Argentina combating i suppose british propaganda and did a relatively good job in the period uh, the, in 1920 in um working with local irish argentines and building networks and building um solidarity movements uh, which caused the british um considerable pain and, and difficulty why would argentina be such a hot spot for Irish revolutionaries? And the answer, quite simply, was that the Irish who came to Argentina were citizens of an independent, free republic. And all the Irish were trying to do was to actually sort of achieve the same status uh, at home as the Argentine and Irish Argentines um, enjoyed um, 
and had enjoyed since their arrival in that new country. So Bulfin had, uh, he found it easy or relatively easy to mobilize people and people were already mobilized. So um, uh, there was considerable activity in 1920 and early 21. Um, and there was a lot of money collected for the Irish in, in Argentina through the Irish White Cross. People were extremely generous. And of course, one of the great propaganda coups, I suppose, for Bulfin, in answer to your question, was uh, the death of Terence McSweeney, or rather the hunger strike of Terence McSweeney. And uh, McSweeney died in, it was the 23rd or 25th of October, 50 years ago, or whatever, it, I, I won't do the maths now, but um, um, he, uh, he, he was um, in 1920, uh, 1920, so um, what are we talking about, sort of 70 years ago, is it? Hmm? Oh, it's 100 years ago. And maths was never my strong suit. Um, 100 years ago, so we're celebrating this centenary. And um, it was uh, the activity around the hunger strike and death of Terence McSweeney was quite extraordinary and uh, was a deep source of concern to the British who couldn't fully comprehend why it was possible for the Sinn Feiners or the radicals or the whatever in, in Buenos Aires to festoon the city with posters and to cause great uh, alarm uh, to the very large pro-British um, populace uh, living <clears throat> in the city at the time. Bulfin um, was gifted, and I, again, I might stress here that his sister Anita was with him in Argentina, and little credit has been given to her. And I think she deserves a lot of um, the, uh, when, when talking about diplomacy, Irish diplomacy in 1920 in Argentina, Anita Bulfin did an awful lot of the hard work. She was an excellent administrator. Uh, she was um, a good, very good linguist and did a very good, was a great asset to Bulfin, who had neither resources and nor, in some respects, the temperament, because he was all the time wanting to go back to Ireland to do what he liked best, and that was confronting the British directly um, in ambushes or in other, in other physical force ways. So, you know, Bulfin is a figure, um, Laura, um, that is, he is easy to understand in some respects, and for him, being in Argentina, he loved Argentina, of course, but being there when there was a revolution in Ireland for him was a great penance. He didn't get back to Ireland until 1922, uh, um, and uh, then the Civil War unfolded, and Bulfin played no part in Irish politics um, um, from the time he came back. Um, apart from attending 1916 commemorations, he played no part in Irish politics which was a shame to some, to some extent. Does that answer your question, Laura? Okay. Yes, a lot. And I think that mentioning Anita, it's interesting to, uh, for, for students to go and research more about yeah. her because, uh, as you said, very little is known uh, about yeah. her. Uh, diplomatic. No, she was, she was <laughs> suffering from tuberculosis. Then, she was suffering from, and, you know, went came to Argentina before Bulfin, before Eamon Bulfin, to try and regain her health. But I would say, uh, just in parenthesis, mm -hmm. that um, Anita Bulfin is one of the people who is barely mentioned in the, in the, in the Irish diplomatic context. And if one looks at the role of Irish women uh, in the Diplomatic, revolutionary diplomatic service, um, they 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 do a lot of hard work, but when it come came to the peace and the civil war, the end of the civil war and the new state, um, most of these women were written completely out of public life or out of the professional diplomatic service. Now many of them had taken the anti-treaty side, but uh, though there were people around who ought to have been put on the staff of the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs, but that was not the case. Right, right. And then um, uh, Bulfin 
asked for some some help to De Valera, and De Valera sent Hinel. So why why did he send Hinel if Bulfin was still there? What do you know if there is any other plan behind that? Well, the the, the central plan was um, Lawrence Hinel <clears throat> was a celebrated um, Irish MP, and at this stage he was a a TD or a TD or a, a member of the Dáil. Um, he, he was had been a thorn in the side of the British right throughout, uh, right from the 1880s, and um, had uh, a, there is a file this thick in the uh, public record office or the National Archives in in Kew in London, devoted exclusively to Bulfin or to 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 Ginell, together with transcripts of all his speeches around the country, which is a great service to the historian. The RIC did a great service by recording everything that he that he said. Now, Genel was sent to Argentina because De Valera thought that it was um, a place where perhaps funds could be raised um, <clears throat> uh, by uh, by running uh, a similar campaign as he had as Genel had helped run in America in North America that is a bond drive to raise money uh, in substantial sums of money. But by the time, so Lawrence Gennell was a, he was a, a personality and he, um, on, Bulfin was self-effacing. Um, Gennell was a showman, a personality, and his wife uh, was very much, very conscious of her status. There was a certain amount of tension between Bulfin and uh, and and the Ganels, but they, they they managed to work out a modus operandi. So the answer to your question, De Valera sent Bulfin, or sent Ganel to Argentina in the summer of 1921, in order to help Bulfin to provide provide Bulfin with um, additional support, and then to sort of engage in a bond drive. But at the same time, because of the status that Ginell had, he could command uh, a presence uh, with the Argentine ministers. And uh, one of his great coups, when he was in, uh, some weeks after he arrived, he was received by the Argentine foreign minister, Puy Redon, um, in, a, in a private capacity. But this certainly sort of caused the British to send rebukes to Argentina. Now, why why did this happen? It, it happened to some extent because um, um, Yuri Gojen and the radicals were facing into a presidential election. And just as in the United States today, Trump and Biden, they both want the Irish vote. Uh, so too in Argentina, um, um, Yuri Gojen uh, was looking looking forward to the radical the support from the from the Irish, which he had in large measure. But that was one of the reasons why um, Ginell was received so well. And then um, Ginell traveled the country, of course, um, in and re uh, being received by the Irish right through the Pampas. And there are wonderful photographs of Ginell uh, at uh, functions in Bernardo Tuerto, in Mercedes, in a whole range of places. So Ginell lifted the profile uh, for uh, the Irish in Argentina and re reinforced Bulfin's presence. So uh, that's part of the reason why I think De Valera sent sent um, sent Guinell. Um, the, his the calculations about funding, um, I think, was were under were, there was no real foundation to think uh, to believe that it was possible to raise large sums of money in Argentina. There were very wealthy Irish Argentines. But I think the Irish Argentines were suffering from donor fatigue by the time Ganell arrived. A lot of money had been given to the White Cross. And, you know, pay, giving money um, to buy Irish bonds was a very risky business. And wealthy people don't tend to, you know, give their money to utopian causes. So I think that for that reason, um, Poor Ganell, having set out and believed that he was going to 
do very well, wound up with a very having to give back a lot of the money um, because of the 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 clash over the treaty uh, and the fact that he was anti-treatyite as was Ulfen. Um, <clears throat> so the 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 campaign, I think, volatilized and uh, you know. Ginell, who was a very unwell man in Argentina, spent a good deal of his time in hospital in Mercedes with the Blue Sisters, Irish Sisters, um, didn't have the robust health at that stage, I think, to um, conduct the work that he was sent to do in, in 1921. So he came back to Ireland in early 1922. Um, Again, um, one could say that he was a major success at the popular level because he had mobilized our Irish Argentino you know, public opinion in a way that Bulfin had done to some extent. But of course, Genel had the, the status, I suppose, to, um, to command bigger audiences in the, in the Arge in, in, among, uh, among Irish Argentines. And um, uh, Genel. <clears throat> was recruited by Dev when he came back, De Valera, to, uh, and De Valera sent him to the United States to try and head up the anti-treaty diplomatic mission. Um, but tragically, he died alone in a um, Washington hotel room in, in the summer of 1923. So this was a, a tragedy for, for the Ganell, Ganell family. Thank you. Thank you, Dermot. I think it's very enlightening <laughs> to, to have this uh, context of, at that time. Yes, no, anyway. Big lesson. <laughs> anyway, so now my next question. You have already answered part of it. So I move on to the part of the question when I ask you how important was the Irish Argentine Catholics to the newly Irish immigrants? How important was the part the Irish Argentine Catholic played in the lives of the newcomers? Um, uh, did all the Irish Argentine always agree with the clerical directions? Um, no, being Irish Catholics, we have a very ambivalent attitude towards authority and hierarchy. And that was the case in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. Um, I should point out, just before I answer your question, that one of the things I don't do in this book, leaving um, a task for another historian, is to look at Irish Protestant mission in Argentina in the 19th and 20th century. Presbyterians, uh, Church of Ireland, Church of England, um, Methodists, etc., etc. So um, I, I, don't, so I don't deal with that. Now, your question in relation to the role of the <clears throat> of the Irish uh, the, the Catholic Church, um, I don't think one can understate the importance of uh, the Catholic uh, clergy in the building of an Irish identity and of giving some cohesion, social cohesion, to the Irish um, in in Argentina in the latter part of the uh, of the of the nineteenth century. In the first instance. <clears throat> The um, father, Dominic Fahey, who was not the first Irish uh, missionary to Argentina, uh, but came in the early 1840s, um, he was certainly the one who had the greatest impact and had the foresight to bring out from Argentina, from Ireland chaplains, um, to recruit chaplains, and also the Sisters of Mercy uh, to run the schools, the hospital, uh, and um, an orphanage in the 1850s. So from that point of view, one can see sort of somebody like Fahi directing the Irish immigrants, as Usher argues, uh, to um, take uh, land that is offered at cheap prices um, in, the 18, in the 1850s and 1860s. So Fahi's great desire was to ensure that the Irish didn't stay in the city. And I think that would be borne out by future research, um, but direct them to the countryside where it was much safer and from a moral point of view, much more healthy. So they didn't run the temptation of falling into bad company in the cities. Um, now, 
Um, we know about the sort of role played by Fahi, and that has been well documented. But moving on sort of towards the sort of la latter part of the 19th century, the 1870s, 1880s, <clears throat> the arrival of the Passionists and the Palatines, uh, two male orders, was very important um, in solidifying uh, the Irish community and in providing, you know, contact in a very structured way uh, because the chaplains of an earlier generation um, did a circuit and tried to establish, you know, small chapels or were given sort of uh, land to build a chapel by one of the estancieros. But the um, Palatines and the Passionists um, came and, you know, put down very deep roots and were very mobile. So, for example, Holy Cross in Buenos Aires, it started out as a tin shed, you know, was opened in the 1890s as a great Gothic spectacle. I think a very fine church, as was Mercedes uh, at a later date in 19, it was 1920, <clears throat> 1932, when the big church in Mercedes was opened. So there was a, a, a the, pa the Passionists and the Palatines were, were organizers and they, um, in, a, in a sense, they had a wide missionary context. They, they, they had annual retreats um, and missions. Uh, they, um, so they were very much part of the life of Irish, of, of Catholic Argentina. And, um, and they uh, put a structure, I think, on a, par a kind of parish structure on, um, on, on uh, which facilitated close contact with the Catholic Church. So I'm familiar with a lot of the small towns in the in the Pampas that are Irish towns, but many of them would have been serviced through from Mercedes by sort of the by the Palatines or you know by the passionists from Capitan Sarmiento, for example. You know, if you go to I mean, as I was sh sh not shocked, but when you arrive in Capitan Sarmiento and you look at the uh, old passionist. Um, monastery, the, which is now no longer sort of in the hands of the, the Passionists, but also there's a church, a Gothic church, rising straight out of the Pampas. And I always think, when, when I looked at it, I thought this is a, um, a scene from Star Wars, as if this, you know, piece of Irish Catholicism was planted, you know, in, you know, this wonderful sort of landscape. But completely incongruous, incongruously, you know, what in the vernacular architectural terms had, you know, the Gothics, you know, Gothic style to do with Argentina, but it was very much a part of Irish Argentina, and it was the importation of the Irish, you know, church revolution, uh, re building revolution that took place at the end of the 19th century, uh, that this was imported to Argentina. Uh, and so, so I wouldn't, I couldn't stress uh, more the role of the Passionists and the Palatines in, and the Sisters of Mercy, of course, who come back in the eighteen in the eighteen nineties to uh, to Argentina, having left in the eighteen in the in the eighteen sixties. So there is a the, the Irish are well served in terms of schools, in, in terms of uh, you know the parish structure, in terms of missions and. Uh, and contact with the church. Also, interestingly, and I, I would like very much another, you know, generation of scholars to look at the nature of Argentine Irish Catholicism, uh, because it is very much a post, you know, it is very much a Vatican one Catholicism. Um, and in the 19th century in Ireland, the devotional revolution, which was the centralization of the church, the organization of the church into proper parish structures, uh, the, um, the outlawing of the old patron systems and the, um, the, the pre-famine Ireland practices, which were very, the, the, the wakes that went on for days um, and uh, other things of that kind were replaced by a devotionalism that was imported from the continent and, and uh, very much part of Vatican I, that is the assertion of a, of a centralized Catholicism. And that I think figures fairly prominently 
in the Irish Catholicism uh, as practiced by the Palatines and the Passionists at the end of the 19th century. I don't say that in any critical way, I simply report it as being a fact, as far as I can see. Um, and in that, so, uh, so, so, so your question is, um, is, a, is a very important one and that will be answered more completely by another generation of scholars. I know uh, that the, I know the answers, which I would never say uh, when I, do, I haven't done the proper investigations, but let's say I have hypotheses that I'm, I'm sure will be proven accurate when we get down to the granular level of, of, of re of re um, of re um, of reimagining the um, parish structures, those little towns, lobos, and others like you know, of that kind, where you know you had um, a, a, an Irish an Irish church presence, and so 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 I I think that there's a lot of work to be done in that area, but I. I can't. I I can only affirm and agree with your, uh, which well well you didn't you didn't actually take a position. You asked me a question, so I can only um, I can only take from what you've asked me uh, a position that is uh, quite strong in relation to the role of Irish imported Irish clergy nuns uh, to Argentina at the end of the nineteenth or the latter part of the nineteenth century. They had an immense influence on. On the Irish now. Oh, you asked me about authority. Um, I always think, and I think that this will be borne out, that in a country that, in a sense, um, has such an affection for the tango, and that has, oh yeah, in a sense, plays such an important role. I don't think that Irish Catholics um, would have allowed themselves to be, um, let's say, dragooned in the way that I, the Irish in the 1920s in Ireland were dragooned into not having the foreign dances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that the Irish um, were on a hiding, the Irish clergy were on a hiding to nothing if they thought they could actually, so they could actually um, dilute the Argentine part of being an Irish Argentine. These were interlocked at this stage and you couldn't possibly and um, expect Irish Argentines uh, to behave in a very puritanical way, um, uh, particularly sort of when these great um, gatherings took place uh, around missions and uh, and uh, marriages, you know, a few marriages in a in a in a house. Those those that kind of informality that 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 existed, uh, which. Um, I, I maybe it's a view that uh, will not be borne out, but by the by the evidence. But <clears throat> I, I feel that I feel that Irish, the Irish Argentines Argentinized Irish Catholicism. You know, they 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 they, they diluted the worst excesses of the um, of the Counter Reformation. I hope. There, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yes, just thank to you Yes, that kind of thought. Um, it's interesting to see that this uh, Catholic structure, especially of the Palatines and the Passionists, as you say, the Sisters of Mercy, um, the important role that they play in, in the 70s, in the 20th century, in the 70s, that they even pay with their own lives in 1976, the Palatines, when, they, when it was the coup of state, isn't it? Yes, I think that... It's it's very interesting to note that in the nineteenth century, um, the names of the of the nuns, the religious, the female religious, wouldn't be very well known or wouldn't appear in the in the history books. There are a few names that I have put into the history books. So so the, the, the their role and you know how do you how do you make personalities out of you know these. You know, an order, or saying the Sisters of Mercy. These were individuals who came out and spent their lives in in Argentina, died and were buried in Argentina. So they deserve not to be um, anonymized. You know? mm -hmm. Now, um, in relation to the sort of evolution of the Irish presence um, and Irish Argentine presence, of course, 
um, the Irish, uh, the, the religious orders like the Passionists and the Palatines, indeed the Sisters and the, and the Sisters of Mercy, etc., had great success in recruiting vocations from Irish Argentines, second, third generation Irish Argentines. Um, and they became, of course, members of the religious orders. Um, of, 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 of those two orders and, and he, by the 1970s had come to play a very prominent role in the religious orders. So the, so the Irish Argentines, uh, you know, gradually, in a sense, assert their presence in the different, in both the Passionists and the Palatines and are very prominent uh, by 1976. So, for example, um, as you mentioned it, and this is uh, this, I do cover this in my book. Um, the, um, Alfredo Leighton, who was murdered in on the fourth of July, nineteen seventy-six, in San Patricio in in, in Belgrano, um, in Buenos Aires, and um, you know his his family is in a sense Irish Argentine. Um, Leighton was sent by the Passionists, or by the, sorry, by the Palatines to Ireland in 1934 after the Eucharistic Congress. So a priest going back in the Eucharistic Congress took Leyden to Ireland. He did his philosophy in Ireland, his theology in Rome, and he came back. So what I'm trying to, to stress is there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a role, there's a way in which um, that gen new generation of Irish Argentines ordained or professed, as in the case of women religious, um, you know, came by the seventies to play a significant role in the, in in their religious orders. Alfredo Kelly from Mercedes, mm -hmm. um, uh, who was also murdered in nineteen seventy six uh, with uh, Alfredo Leyden, he is again sort of very much part and parcel of a very proud Irish Argentine family, and again and. Uh, uh, Father Dufault, who was um, the third priest murdered in 76, um, had done his philosophy and part of his theology in Ireland uh, in, this in the 30s, he, in, from 1929. So he was, he, was, he was older than both Leiden and, and uh, you say Le I think you pronounce it Leiden in Argentina. I, I, here we say Leiden, but you say Leiden, I think, in Argentina. So um, he was, uh, he, he again, so there's two good examples of Irish Argentines who, uh, in a sense, are very much part of a of a new church in Argentina. We, there are nuances, of course, here, but they are part of a of a of a forward-looking church in Argentina uh, that um, that was targeted by the military, and in a sense, um, it was a kind of ritual killing in 1976. Um, uh, uh, but th those two men, uh, Leyden and uh, Kelly, uh, were, you know, as close to be, you know, to being sort of the at the heart of the Irish Argentine community as as you were bound to get by that stage. Very, mm -hmm. Kelly did not study, by the way, in Ireland. Kelly visited Ireland, but he studied in Rome. He was an exception. Um, so, uh, so. Laura, you asked me about yeah the, the, that that church, of course, and there is a there is a a, a change um, in both those orders, um, and the uh, the 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 role played by both those men, although very different, both Leyden and and Kelly, just to because you mentioned the the massacre of uh, San Patricio in seventy six, um, I just take those two names to illustrate. Uh, 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 men of very diverse thinking in terms of the future of the church, etc. But you know, rock solid on the core values that um, um, that uh, the, the of human rights and the protection of human rights and civil liberties. Uh, they, they, that that they there they shared a, a common philosophy without any doubt. Um, and uh, the. Um, we could look at the other presence, the presence of other Irish uh, who are Irish, Irish in the 70s in Argentina, the Dominicans up in the north, uh, the um, Dominican sisters in, in, um, 
in Buenos Aires uh, who ran a college called San, Pat San, San, San Domenico, uh, <clears throat> which used to be the Keating Institute near Santa, Santa Cruz. Um, the uh, the uh, Sisters of Mercy, of course, were there. The Blue Sisters were still there. Um, so there was a very strong cohort, small in number, but significant in terms of the presence that they ex their presence and the role that they exercised in that in that terrible period of the 70s and the 80s. Thank you very much. Very enlightening. No, so I, 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 I think you have a, yes. your last question, Laura, and you finish our questions and leave oh. for the students. To oh, yeah. The, the only perhaps uh, interesting thing that we could ask in our Dermot is um, all this interest because lately we have found a lot of um, in the last five years many publications on the on the Irish diaspora to South America mainly to Argentina. So we have many many scholars uh, publishing that. What is the reception of these kind of books in Ireland? What do you think? Is it something that, because we motivate our students mainly because we are on this side of the Atlantic to try to go and research on all these issues and then we find that they are also from the other side of the Atlantic very much interested in, in developing this kind of research. But what about the, the reception of these books in Ireland? Um, <clears throat> well, among scholars, yeah, of course, or, they're very well they're very well received in the universities and that um if they're written in english they have a wider sort of impact and um you know so you one, sometimes one is limited by the language in which they're written um but from a scholarly point of view the opening up of um irish history and irish studies um i'm just uh, starting to coordinate a project called the internationalization of the Irish Revolution. And um, as a as a you know young historian um, in the 60s, I, I I was always conscious of the international context in which the island was set. And I think, you know, thanks to the role that Laura you played and Noelia, Noelia you're playing and your other colleagues who are here and um, the, the that has been a, a, um, an eye opener for many scholars who have basically and with great justification concentrated on the history of Ireland in an Anglo Irish context. So, in a, in other words, within the that's one of the primary sort of ways in which Irish history has been interrogated um, <clears throat> through the. In the uh, in the Anglo-Irish context, or in the British Commonwealth context. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take a, an institution like the Catholic Church, which I refer to as soft power, and you look at the imprint of uh, you know the Irish in Latin America, um, and uh, the Irish in Latin America were less well represented than in Africa, for example, or in the in Asia. <clears throat> but uh, you look at you look at those. Um, you look at the, the role that that, that that has been played and you can see that the history of Ireland can't be written in an isolated context. Mm -hmm. So you do a great service. The more you write about the Irish in Brazil, in Argentina, in, uh, in other parts of the world, the more you internationalize our, our that is the, our Irish historians, our concept of how history has to be written, and um, and 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 if we can shift ourselves, which we have done substantially, there's no doubt about it. Uh, the younger generation of Irish historians know languages; they can work in Spanish or Portuguese. Um, you know, they can. You know, any of my postgraduate students, you know, if they wanted to be, to study to do this, they'd say, "I'll just go and learn Czech." You know, and I love that kind of. Um, you know, that language was simply a, the first hurdle on the way to sort of doing your research rather than some, you know, um, mysterious uh, uh, mysterious challenge that could never be properly 
you know, properly accomplished. Um, so you have done a great service uh, in, as I see it in Latin America now, and I see uh, work being done on Mexico and Peru and on Chile and on, you know, no longer just the 19th century, the wars of independence, um, uh, Daniel Florence O'Leary and, um, um, and Brown and many others, you know, they're, they're, they're now, now you, you're, you're, you, you scholars in, in Latin America have brought another great, um, great, you've done another great service. You're all, um, um, I learned a word in, 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 when I was in, 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 in no, in, 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 in Venezuela many years ago. And it said that poly, poly camburistas. Uh, in other words, you you, what you are is you are, um, you are, um, interdisciplinary in the way in which you approach your subject so that um you we can't say um oh i'm an historian therefore i don't know anything about sociology because you can't be an historian without you know knowing and studying sociology literature or whatever but you in your formation uh, come from a from a background and a tradition whereby by definition, you're multidisciplinary, and that's you see, that's a great, uh, that's a great, um, a great, uh, a great strength. Now, um, you know, I, I, I remember as when I was much younger, and it, I, I once, you know, heard an English historian say, "Well, you know, why do I need to learn languages to write history? You know, I'm writing about English." So, but that was that was not in the 1960s. People are much more enlightened now. <laughs> Um, and you know, so I so you what you do so how how are you being with I, I think what you're doing is um is raising the bar and you are uh, challenging us and you are encouraging us uh, to see the dimensions of Irish and of the Irish presence in different in different contexts and I don't mean to romanticize our presence if slavers you know yes. Estancieros, um, mm -hmm. aeons, you know, you don't do that in your work. So, so you you provide you provide us with, you know, good analysis of uh, very difficult subjects, and that's why we now in turn are learning, and we're beginning to, I suppose, integrate your insights into our work. You know, it's it's a it's for me it's a great um it's a great uh, liberation you know uh because when i was a an undergraduate um and i wanted to do postgraduate work and i came to this panel of uh, professors very good professors and they and they and i told them what i wanted to do on my masters i wanted to write the history or the biography of a labor leader called tom johnson oh they said if you want to do that go to the politics department because that's where they do journalism. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I rebelled against uh, that. I remember one of my colleagues uh, in the same uh, class wanted to do a thesis on the economic war in the 1930s. Now, if I had said to that panel in 1970, I would like to study the Irish uh, Civil War or the War of Independence, um, I, I would certainly have been uh, deemed to be somebody who um, doesn't understand the very basic tenets of history, because for that generation to be adventurous was to go beyond the death of Parnell. That's 1891, by the way. And then latterly sort of to come up to 1914, to the origins of the, you know, the First World War. But fortunately, my generation, with Sister Benvenuto, whom you mentioned, this wonderful uh, radical and uh, nun who did her thesis on um, a uh, an Irish Dominican in 16th century um, Lisbon um, um, and uh, who, who you know had cast her net wide um, they, they, those there were people there who were basically um, uh, oh yes another one Maureen Wall I mentioned her because she taught a course 
on the 1920s, uh, 1920s, 1930, uh, on the first decade of the free state. And that was regarded as heretical by our peers. So we benefited from that exposure to modern Irish history. Now, you know, Irish history has, th there's no real terminal date. You know, ye yesterday is Irish history, you know, so, but, <clears throat> but I am, um, I deeply, I personally am deeply indebted uh, to you, um, the scholars who have traversed the different fields, the field of Irish history and uh, the history of slavery, the history of Irish literature, and the um, the um, you know the such 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 um, such complex and nuanced uh, um, uh, analyses is uh, is a real fillip to uh, to those of us who have been I suppose teaching our students over the decades to not to sort of but to be on on without frontiers in the range of their knowledge. That is to go and study, you know, the you know the history in an African context or in an Asian context or whatever. So, um, my my, <clears throat> that's in in a way not to in any sense uh, engage in flattery. It's just to state the facts. The facts are that Irish history now has been internationalized, and that um, and uh, and the whole role of the, of Ireland in its different contexts is now being explored by people like yourself, like yourself, both of you here. And of course, uh, the wonderful book that recently emerged on the Irish in Peru. And we were likely to see there's a wonderful piece of work done on the Irish in, in uh, Irish railway workers in Cuba, uh, the work on, 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 on um, Mexico. And, uh, uh, you know, th these are, these are whole new areas that can only be dealt with in an integrated way as part of this the centre canon of Irish history. You know, it's world history. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. we're an island, but we have cast our net very wide and exactly. made our history all the more complex and challenging as a consequence. But you know, this Thank is <laughs> so this is the excitement that I have going back to Argentina or going to Latin America. I yes. like and I, I really like the uh, the freedom of your academic, uh, the, the no frontiers attitude towards your academic, uh, uh, your academic work. And, um, uh, you know, for me, I had to spend a lot of time reading theology in writing this book um, on the uh, 20 and the 20th, on 20th century Argentina, you know, it was, um, but uh, it was, it was, it's very interesting. So you challenge us and uh, you continue to uh, broaden the horizons of Irish historians. And not alone that, you have integrated so much into the wider canon of Irish history. So it's no longer the island of Ireland, you know, that we're looking at. And if we get, if there's no fog on the channel, we can see Britain, if we can see England on a good day. So that's all, that's, that's past now. That's part of, that's part of the, the um, the the <laughs> there's a new awakening, and I'm delighted that I've seen a good deal of it being realised. Now oh, you were asking me a question. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Now it's our students' time because I think they are eager to ask you a few questions. Not many. I think three or three questions. You know, no, no, I'm yeah, I'm quite happy to to answer all their questions. Oh, thank um, you. So we have a question from James Spalty. It's a musician who lives in Ireland. And he asks, did you know Che Guevara's great, great, great grandfather was Patrick Lynch, who emigrated to Spain and then Argentina? <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and um, one of the Irish artists, are, there are two Irish artists, Robert Bala, who are responsible for one of those great iconic images of Che Guevara, um, mm -hmm. which you see on T-shirts all over the world. And he told me, the artist, he said, I never got a penny uh, for the design, you know. So um, he, he lost out. He could have been a millionaire by now. Um, yes, uh, there is that tenuous connection between, um, uh, or at least 
they, they, that Che Guevara uh, sports the name of Lynch. But in many respects, and um, I don't want to sound uh, heretical, uh, but I, Che Guevara is the least Irish Argentine of the of the of the people that I've studied. He's an internationalist first and foremost, and he has a um, he has a, 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 a certain curiosity about Ireland, but in the context of his upbringing and and of his um, formation, um, I I haven't seen him in his writings, uh, and here I can be slapped down, of course, because I don't I haven't read his writings for a long time. Um, you know that the uh, the Irish Revolution played an important role in his historical formation, um, and um, he visited Ireland, I think, on two occasions, maybe three, but all the time as stopovers. You know that he was coming from somewhere, and the plane broke down, or he had to stop. You know, Aeroflot in Shannon, and uh, his most memorable visit to Ireland was to Shannon when he. Um, went into the town and went to a few local bars and um, enjoyed the hospitality that he was offered. He was recognized, of course, did a brief interview with an enterprising Irish journalist and then got back on the plane, um, uh, probably in a, in, in a state um, that even uh, Cuban rum wouldn't leave him in uh, because uh, he had been uh, hosted too 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 well in in Limerick, and mm. um, his interview is very very brief, and um, um, nonetheless um, there are Irish Argentines who are delight to be associated with uh, the name of Che Guevara and others who would be less uh, enthusiastic. Um, he came a second time to Ireland. He was in Dublin, and that was a rather cursory and short visit. I think he was either on his way to Algeria or coming from Algeria. So um, I don't think that there that I've ever found any body of evidence that Che Guevara was heavily influenced by the Irish uh, revolutionary, um, the, the Irish revolutionary tradition. He was pleased to be Irish, I think, and um, uh, he was, um, he was, uh, he was, he was uh, somebody who, who is recognized by his name, Che Guevara Lynch, but the world probably knows him more as Che Guevara, don't you think? <laughs> Thank you. Next, who is next? Francisco Fosser. Is there any evidence of Irish language used in Argentina? Yes, the answer is yes. And uh, I try to cover that in my, um, in my book, the new book, um, at the end of the 19th century, William Bulfin probably spoke Irish quite well, the journalist and editor and owner, proprietor of the, the Southern Cross, the a weekly Irish newspaper, because there was another one called The Standard. But um, the uh, Conor na Gaelgar, or the Gaelic League, was, uh, when it was founded, <clears throat> one, of, uh, one of the early overseas branches was 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 set up in um, in Buenos Aires in 1898 and that brought together a number of Irish speakers from different parts of Argentina and um, the uh, the uh, it was set up in 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 Buenos Aires um, in the in, sorry in the church in in the Holy Cross the Passionist Church and a number of the Passionists would have spoke would have spoken Irish but there were, you see, if, if you look at the, the pattern of emigration, um, Santiago Usher's, Monsignor Usher's father came to Argentina in the 1850s, married an, uh, uh, an Irish woman and um, had a large family. But he was a native Irish speaker. So he appears in 1898 as one of the most prominent members of the Gaelic League. And some people... There were far, I think there were uh, laborers, um, dockers in La Boca, Irish, who were Irish speakers. There was a doctor in the Andes who was an Irish speaker. So once you set up the 
uh, the the Gaelic league in in in, in uh, Buenos Aires, um, it was very active for a number of years, and it did have a number of uh, native Irish speakers. So the Southern Cross, as Laura well knows, you know, is very um, Gaelic in its typography, and uh, mm -hmm. it has a it has a weekly column or poem under the banner called Conran de Velga, which is the Irish for the Gaelic League. Now, so, <coughs> excuse me, I need to think. <coughs> in the, in the, um, in, in the early, uh, in the early period of the 20th century, uh, 1899, 1901, the Gaelic League in Dublin acknowledges generous donations from the uh, from Argentina. Now the money wasn't. I don't know how much. Well, I calculated. I think it's in my book. But the money wasn't staggeringly large. But it was highly significant because the Gaelic League had no money at the time. So when Bulfen came to Ireland in 1903 with an estanciero called Suffren, um, who had they had land in Uruguay and in Buenos Aires, um. The, uh, they received a very warm reception from Owen McNeil um, of 1916 fame, the man who countermanded the Order for the Rising, but a great Gaelic scholar, from Porrick Pierce, and they were roundly uh, congratulated for the role that they played in supporting the Gaelic League. And Bulfin became a speaker of great, um, he was very, he was much sought after uh, on his visit. That was the time that he uh, did his uh, how many thousand miles around Ireland and his great book, uh, Rambles in Erin, uh, <clears throat> which appears later, 1906, 1905, 1906, I think. Um, but so there is evidence of Irish in Buenos Aires that I have found. There are uh, there is evidence that there are Irish speakers scattered in different parts of Argentina, but um, I'm not sure of the longevity of the Gaelic League um, into the twentieth into the twentieth century. Um, I haven't pursued it, but again, this is a wonderful topic that some um, some historian of the Gaelic League could follow when they're looking at the Gaelic League abroad, and you know the the branches abroad. So there were the, the, the Gaelic League in in, in, 19, in 1898 in Argentina and Buenos Aires was fortunate to have a number of native Irish speakers, some of the passionists and palatines who would have spoken Irish, probably some of them would have been native Irish speakers, but all of them would have had a good a good knowledge of Irish. Um, and uh, then there were the people like the, the Usher and others who are the native? Who are native Irish speakers? So your que the question is a very uh, important one, but it would be answered by people who study the Gaelic League. I mean, for example, it would I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't some kind of sub branch of the Gaelic League in Rosario. I mean, this is a, you know Irish, very strong Irish city, and I, I would imagine that there would have been some um, even small group of people in Rosario. So this is a question of looking around. I have done a little bit of work, and it, it, you know, it should appear in the book, on the setting up of the Gaelic League in Buenos Aires in 1898, and Bulfin's visit to Ireland in 1903, where he came, uh, sorry, 1902, 19, he came in 1903, rather, uh, to, to, uh, to be a represent, the, the um, Buenos Aires or Argentine representative of the Gaelic League in, in, at the Arrakis or annual convention <laughs> that that year. So um, it's a subject that is, Thanks. I've only scraped the surface. Uh, I'd imagine that in a few years time, they will be finding Irish speakers in Corrientes and in, um, in, in, uh, in, in Tierra del Fuego and other parts of Argentina. Um, because they were, a lot of Irish speakers were poor and probably would have uh, live their lives as peons or as um, as uh, dockers 
or as hordaleros, you know, the kind of uh, knockabouts, the, the, the people who went from one farm to another getting getting work. So that doesn't answer the, your student's question. I don't see the student's name. Oh, Fernando, yeah. Um, no, that's the, that's the next question. Sorry, I, uh, excuse me for not getting, who, who answered the, asked the question? I didn't see that. I've read your article called The Compelling Out. Oh, Fran uh, yeah, Francisco, very good. Francisco, Francisco just yes. go and do, just do the work. Find find that as a topic yourself. Use the um, Southern Cross as a as a base for your research, and you would be surprised how rewarded uh, your work your work would be in in the exposing a new area, um, of and a new story, um, a new narrative on the Irish in Argentina. Mm -hmm. And the next is hi. Oh, I very much so sorry, and I think. There is a lecture by William Bulfi that he defended that the um, children of the Irish Argentine has to learn Irish and they could go to the national uh, university. They could go afterwards to the national university uh, for the time yeah. learning any career, isn't it? Uh, yeah, of course, part of the reason that they were brought back to Ireland was because they should be schooled in an Irish in, in an Irish um, in an Irish tradition, but in, in a kind of traditional Irish way, the, 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 the girls went to a place in Banagher, a very good school run by a strict order of nuns, if that's not an oxymoron, and they, um, they, uh, they too learned, you know, Irish. But, but, but Eamon Bulfin was the one that William Bulfin was particularly careful to try and ra raise him in a radical, but not necessarily a revolutionary tradition. You know, so yes, the girls, they, they all subsequently, in fact, one of the girls married Sean McBride, who was a foreign minister in 1948, 51, and um, uh, he, one of Bulfin's uh, daughters married um, Mac, McBride. So they were radicalized also in their, by their schooling, but more by their, the, the, the march of events during the post-1916 period. Now may I, and I've, oh yes, uh, <clears throat> saved. Now, in, in this book that I've, uh, this manuscript that I've written, um, uh, Fernando, uh, I have um, uh, chronicled um, that uh, case, uh, Patrick Rice. Now, I make a confession here because Patrick Rice was a lifelong friend of mine. So I had a personal interest in trying objectively to um, cro to to cat a, a chronicle in an empirical way a, his role in, in Argentina. Um, I studied with him for four years in the seminary and maintained a lifelong friendship with him. But uh, Patrick Rice uh, was saved by two Irish diplomats, Ambassador Justin Harmon, who many of you will know, and the ambassador at the time, a man called Wilfred Lennon, both of them um, uh, worked very hard to get uh, Rice out of out of jail. Um, he was a little brother of Charles the Foucault, um, and uh, he um, had been in the SV, the, the Divine Word missionaries, and he had, in 1972, joined the Little Brothers of Charles the Foucault. And um, he uh, was both, he was a worker priest. So, he was a carpenter, he worked on building sites in Buenos Aires, and um, he w lived with his community of little brothers, there were about eight or nine of them, and uh, they all had jobs, they all worked in different ways. One of them who uh, was murdered was a road sweeper, a uh, barrendero, I think you say, and uh, uh, called Maurizio Silva, uh, he was killed in 77. But Pat Rice uh, was coming back from a meeting in Via Soldati on the, on the 11th of October 1976. And he was uh, with a catechist called Fatima Cabrera. And they were intercepted uh, by uh, the uh, secret, uh, by, by police, plain clothes police, who fired shots into the ground and uh, bundled them into a car, took them to the police station beat them up badly and uh, separated them, beat them up badly 
and then took them to a uh, clandestine uh, center. Uh, in, it was called uh, Garaje Aso Pardo, uh, one of what must be 500 secret detention centers that the military had established in, in 1976. And there both were very badly tortured. And uh, that was when the Irish diplomats working outside were knew they were working against the clock or, you know, were, were really uh, working against um, time because, you know, there were probably an average of two to three days before somebody would be murdered. And um, what they did was they internationalized uh, his, um, his uh, arrest, got uh, uh, stories in the New York Times and the uh, uh, London Times, and in a sense, brought pressure to bear on the Argentine government through the United Nations and the Irish diplomatic service as a whole, worked in unison to try and bring pressure to bear on the Argentine government. And um, uh, uh, um, Rice, uh, having been very badly tortured with, and Fatima Cabrera also badly tortured, they survived. And probably Fatima Cabrera, Fatima survived because Rice uh, was known and they were taken together. And this, in other words, she was, she couldn't, there wasn't plausible deniability or whatever phrase you wish to know, used to use. They were, they were uh, badly tortured, very badly tortured and tortured in the same room. So that one, you know, that uh, Rice would, in other words, break in some way to stop the torture of his, uh, of the cat of the catechist, whom he hardly knew at the time, and um, he, uh, but they were Rice was then taken to the uh, coordination federal, the federal police day headquarters, and after you know the pressure came from the Irish embassy, and Fatima Cabrera was transferred a little later, and there he stayed for a while. The Irish embassy got to see him, and he was transferred then to um, to La Plata where he spent um, until December uh, when he was deported from Argentina on the 11th of December. And that was a terrible mistake on the part of the Junta because Rice became one of the most effective, outspoken and well uh, organized uh, opponent of the regime between 1977 and, and, uh, and up to 83 in fact when they when they toppled um he uh, he 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 he, uh, he worked in london first then went to washington um and later to Argent to 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 uh, venezuela so um he was a very strong voice and it was very funny because when i used to talk to him about um, his imprisonment, he would say to me, uh, Fernando, this is a roundabout way of answering your question, but um, uh, he used to say to me, um, I remember being at a, uh, a, uh, a concert given by a famous Argentine pianist, Estrada, is that his name, Estrada? Um, and I said to Paddy, I said, how do you know him? And he said, oh, we were in jail together. And then I asked him, I said, I want to meet the foreign minister or the minister for foreign affairs. And he said, oh, he said, that's all right. He said, we were in jail together too. And that was Tayana. Tayana, is that the man's name? He was in, they were all in La Plata at the same time. So Rice um, became a very strong opponent of, of the administration uh, in Argentina, very effective. And uh, it was due to the Irish, Irish diplomacy in 76. And one of the great things about the Irish, two Irish diplomats was they followed their own instincts. They knew they had little time, so they didn't wait to be, you know, given precise instructions. They, you know, they, they really sort of, you know, worked in a very, a very effective way to bring international, the international spotlight on the, on the Rice case. Now, there's a, an interesting footnote to the, um, to this particular thing that I, talk about in my book, but in, a, in relation to human rights and that. Rice was allowed back uh, to Argentina in 1983, 80, 84. And he was prevented from going in because he'd been deported. 
and he met Fatima Cabrera again um, in, and he was back in Argentina three times uh, in, in 84 because Fede Fam, which he had helped found in, in, in Caracas, um, uh, uh, the organization that looked that that was an advocate, uh, an advocate for the families of the disappeared throughout Latin America. Um, he met Fatima Cabrera again. And after three visits, um, they uh, had, had decided that he was leaving the priesthood because he wanted to commit himself to the human rights movement and he felt himself, felt himself constrained within the uh, within his own order um, and more particularly sort of within the priesthood. So he had left and um, he um, formed a, a different relationship with Fatima who agreed to go back to Caracas and they married in Caracas and um, had uh, three children together. And she's living back now because he died in 2010. So Fernando, that's in a kind of a roundabout way, the answer to your question. But I answer in the affirmative. I have ample evidence to show that Justin Harmon and um, uh, um, Wilfred Lennon played an exceptional role in the, uh, in the saving of Patrick Rice in the first instance and in, in securing his release a few months later. And he has acknowledged that in his letters to the foreign ministry, which are on file. So does the, um, that's... Uh, We'll be finishing our uh, our chat today because a few students are leaving because they have classes now. So uh, we, I'm really impressed with your memory. It seems every book is in your mind because you well, you talk about each book so fluently. Am I right, Laura? <laughs> Thank you for that. It was fantastic to listen to you, to have all this panorama. I think that your narrative brought all these, um, a, a very good idea for, for all the audience uh, to see mm -hmm. how, how rich it is that history and how yes. much we have yet to continue researching, mm -hmm. following your steps, as you said, <laughs> open the ways for, for us, for the young scholars. And I think it's so, so good what you said that um, uh, you broaden our horizons while we are doing the same to you. So this is the way that nowadays knowledge has to be constructed. Mm -hmm. Everybody in an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transcultural way that helps mm -hmm. us to construct really a solid knowledge that helps us to understand humankind. Uh, history is repeated again and again in all countries. And so when we bring them in an international way, a pers an international perspective to each case, I think it gives all this richness that you are giving to us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. We also say thank you much, Professor Cole. And uh, students are really, they are sending message all the time, say that they, they are really impressed with you, that they hope you can really come next year well, and see you talking, not virtually, but your presence. Yeah. You that, would be my, that would be my fondest hope. And <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will, that, that this will happen, that we will be united, I mean, in, uh, together in 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 Brazil, and I've I've only been to the south of Brazil, so I look forward to um, Sao Paulo and to uh, to South. Yeah, and uh, I think that we that that I will realize that um, by by hook or by crook. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, thank you very much for joining us today, and. Uh, Hope to see you in the future. All my best for you, for your the publication of your book, your book launch. Who knows, Laura and me will be to that to Cork for your book launch. Yeah, that and that uh, that you certainly get an invitation. Book launch in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be nice. Uh -huh. So I'm. Um, uh, 
So okay. have a good night, sleep. What would you say? Same thing, Laura. All right. What do we do now? Uh, you are. Um... We are finishing and say goodbye. Good night. Yeah, because, thank you. Thank you again for everything. It was thank a real you. privilege to share my few facts and bits of information with you. Thank you. And my regards to students. No, oh, thank you very much. Good thank night. You. Good night See now. Bye, Laura. Bye. Ciao. Bye. I do not know how to cut it.